just wait for 2 3 minutes then we start it let us start it uh, and other people if they want to come they will come on time just let me know i am audible clearly uh, yeah you are audible yeah okay thank you so welcome to gate and pdl physics course we are going to focus on electromagnetic theory as some of the student uh, last time requested to have a live interaction So first, I am going to present a concept, and based on that, we will do some gate question. And I hope it it will be good for you. But if there is something that you will not understand, just ask me. So uh, I started with Cauchy's law because it's the basic foundation of electrostatics, and then we will go through the boundary conditions. And based on that boundary condition, we will solve the problem. So I think you have uh, studied Lamps and Gauss law in twelfth standard as well, and but uh, the understanding from gate perspective is how we can use that Gauss law to solve our problems. So it's uh, the symmetry property that helps us to solve the problem. So what basically Gauss law says is if you have a charge Q. and you wanted to calculate what is the flux that is passing through a uh, small surface s so how do you calculate that so if uh, we already know that the charge q will give electric field in all directions but we wanted to calculate it just in small surface area s so what we do is we calculate what is the electric field line that is passing within this element da and we calculate what is the electric field in this direction and we sort of integrate it over that surface so that will give us the flux within this region uh, that is passing through uh, the surface area l but uh, what gauss is just said is if we allow the in integral over the whole surface within which the charge is lying then the flux generally calculate just by what is the charge inside this region divided by epsilon now so it will tell you that within a uh, surface that enclosed some charge the like um, flux passing through the closed surface is given by q enclosed on epsilon not so q enclosed is the total charge within this region the charge can be in discrete form like q1 q2 q3 
or it can be in continuous form like it will be distributed over a line with line charge density lambda and if you wanted to know what is the total charge over this line we just integrate all this dl element with this line charge density to calculate what is the charge q similarly if we have a charge which is distributed over a surface we can just calculate uh, what is the da element which carry a charge sigma charge density sigma integrate over the whole surface so that will give you the charge q so it can be distributed over a line it can be distributed over a surface or it can be distributed within a volume so uh, q and close is uh, we have to take care of within which region we are going to calculate our flux and this is commonly used to calculate the electric field and it is much more superior method compared to the uh, first principle of plumb's law and this is the divergence form of the gauss law it can be derived from you know divergence equations just uh, want to ask from you people do you want me to derive these formulas yes yes this divergence of e equals to upon epsilon of yeah i will do that so it's coming from this equation that gauss's law say that if you have a closed integral surface integral e vector to da vector which is q and close upon epsilon not so there is this divergence equation which says that if you have any and close uh, closed surface then and a vector v over the surface da you can calculate write it as a volume integral of divergence of that vector multiply or and integrate over the volume element so in this from close integral of e vector to da vector can also be written as volume integral of divergence of e vector into d tau d tau is the volume element here so um, this term on the left hand side is become uh, volume integral of divergence of e dot d tau and the right hand side is q and close upon epsilon not so we can also write q and close in terms of volume integral we know that it can be written as a volume charge density rho into d tau this is the volume integral means if you have some volume element and you take a small element within that region d tau and rho is the charge density inside this region so you can always write q and close by this quantity and one upon epsilon not is constant so when you put this back into the first equation we are left with volume integral of divergence of d e into d tau equals to one upon epsilon not volume integral of rho into d tau and then we can also write volume integral of divergence of e minus rho upon epsilon not and d tau equals to zero so uh, this quantity will be zero only when the this quantity is zero since d tau cannot be zero it is small element so we put the divergence of e minus rho upon epsilon not as zero and divergence of e equals to rho upon epsilon not is a differential form of the same integral equation of gauss's law so basically we are focusing here on this integral equation it is much more helpful for us today but in future if you need you can use the divergence equation as well so um, how it will be useful by taking the use of symmetry property what symmetry property do for us is for example for the case of gauss's law we have let's say a charge q is placed and we want to calculate what will be the electric field at the distance r at any point p so what we do is we just create a symmetric surface a spherical surface around this charge and we wanted to know what will be the electric field at this point p because of this charge q we can solve it directly using coulomb's law but i am mm, telling you how it can be solved using gauss's law 
without symmetry property. This symmetry property we can do is we just take a small element d a, and within this small element we assume that our electric field is going to be constant. So, हमें uh, we have to solve this integral. That is integral of e vector dot d a vector for cos integral. So, best way is to how to know e how to calculate this e vector dot d a. So, we know that it is always going to be mod e vector mod d a vector into cos theta. If somehow we can uh, make mod e and mod d a to be lying in the same direction, like in this small area element, if e vector is in the same direction as the n cap, then cos theta will become one. Since theta will become zero, we have theta is the angle between e vector and the area vector, so it will become zero. So we are just left with mod e vector into d a vector. And since the element we are taken here is very tiny. It is just a small, tiny d element. So within that element, the mod e vector is assumed to be constant. So basically, in all the equations in which we are trying to solve Gauss's integral, we take mod e to be outside by assuming that within d element it is constant, and we just integrate over this d element, mod of this d element. So this is how we are going to use this symmetry property in further. So basic concept will always lie the same. We have to some take a small d element. We take our mod e outside of integral and integrate over this d element. If e is constant, if e is not constant, then you cannot take it outside. It means there will be some cases in which e has some dependency. In that case, you cannot take it outside. So there are three kind of properties that is used to solve the equation based on Gauss's law. One is the spherical symmetry in which we are trying to build a spherical surface around a charge or some spherical surface, a concentric sphere around another sphere. In case of cylindrical symmetry, we are assume a Gaussian surface of cylinder, which will be like we wanted to calculate what is the electric field due to a line charge. Then we assume a Gaussian surface of cylinder, and in a plane symmetry, we are assume a Gaussian surface to be like a square pill box or maybe a cuboid, very thin cuboid kind of thing. This is generally used when we wanted to calculate electric field due to a thin surface charge. So we are going to uh, see the example for the case of. Simple sphere. For example, we have a simple sphere, and the charge is distributed uniformly inside the sphere. And we wanted to calculate the electric field at any point P due to this uniform distribution of charge. So what we do is we create a Gaussian sphere around this charge. Something is an imaginary sphere. It has to be concentric. So at and at any distance R. So we calculate. On first, the left hand side, which is the cross integral e vector dot d a. So, as I have told earlier, we assume that within this small area element, electric field and d a vector is in the same direction. So, the dot product will become simple mod e into d a. Cos theta will become one, and mod e will come out of integral, and we are just left with surface integral of d a. Now, in spherical polar coordinate. There is surface d a element in r cap direction is given by uh, since there is uh, electric field due to this at this point is in going to be in r cap since it is always away from the charges so this direction is the r cap direction so d a vector in r cap direction is given by r square sine theta d theta d phi in the r cap direction so this d a vector Is an integral of r square sine theta d theta d phi, and d theta varies from minus phi to phi, and d phi varies from zero to two phi. So this integral will then become r square minus phi to phi cos theta integral of d theta sine theta. This one is separate out. And zero to two pi d five, so we are left with 
2 into 2 pi into r square that is 4 pi r square so we are left with mod e into 4 pi r square and since living cos in such case uh, the charge lies inside completely is q so q enclosed is q so mod e will become p upon epsilon naught but it's not the mod e quantity we want the e vector and we already know that the charge electric field always going to be away from the charge q if it is positive and it is towards the charge q if it is negative so electric field vector is in the arc direction so this will be the case for a very simple case when we have a spherical charge kind of symmetry a spherical symmetry there is also the case when we have when we have uh, like plane symmetry plane sheet there are also cases when we wanted to know that what will be the electric field if we have an infinity plane sheet of charge and the charge is uniformly distributed across this sheet so um, in that case what we do is we uh, we have to assume a kind of box like a match box and we can uh, put it one half of the part is about the plane and half of the part on the other side it is something like that match box so i will draw it like this you have a plane sheet of charge and you want it to create a match box kind of fill box here so this is and uh, this match box is half the above the surface and half below the surface with surface charge density sigma so we have to calculate what is the electric field due to this infinite surface charge density we are again going to use close integral e vector dot da equals to sig q and close upon epsilon naught so in this case the, the width of this match box always assumed to be epsilon and the area is assumed to be a so the only the upper surface and the lower surface is going to contribute this uh, width and breadth part will not going to contribute since it have a infinitesimal width so electric field in this direction is e vector and the area vector is is also in this direction and below the surface electric field is also in this direction down direction and the surface area is also in n cap direction so we have mod e vector with a complete area a plus mod e vector area a is equals to q and close upon epsilon naught so the q and close within this sigma is in this a region is sigma into a by epsilon naught since a q and close i have told you is given by sigma into da and here a is in kind of more uniform so we just like with sigma into a so we are left with two mod e vector into a equals to sigma upon epsilon naught so mod e vector is equals to sigma upon 2 epsilon naught and it is always going to be away from that surface so we can write e vector as sigma upon 2 epsilon naught in the n cap direction the direction is known as uh, above uh, from the surface so uh, this concept of plane sheet charge is very useful when we are talking about this boundary condition uh, last time i have told you when we have an interface between two medium and we know what is the electric field in one medium and what is the electric field in another medium this kind of problem is mainly being solved by this concept of boundary condition and this interface between two medium will act as a uh, will act like same charge density sigma that i have told you here so uh, there are two boundary conditions here for example i'll tell you uh, i'll tell you something else let us consider the case that we have an interface so uh, we have an electric field e so what are the possibility let's say x y z 
so what are the possibility that electric field have component which is perpendicular to this interface and it all may have component which is parallel to this interface i have drawn actually i have drawn it wrong let's consider that the electric field is something at an angle so it may have a parallel component and it may parallel component which is like this like you can think of this interface as a paper and i just place a pencil in front of paper so your pencil and paper will become parallel so that will become e parallel component and the other case is when we have a e perpendicular component just like you have put your pencil such that it can go through that paper so this will become e perpendicular component so how the boundary conditions will be different for these component for the case when when electric field won't uh, is parallel to the surface and the other case is when electric field is perpendicular to the surface so for the parallel case we use the gauss theorem that i have also i have told you right now for example we have a thin sheet of this interface now i have drawn it in other another fashion but it is the same interface so we uh, just draw a gaussian pill box here something like this and it is about the surface half of it and below the surface and with the width epsilon it's an area a so we wanted to know the electric field uh, how it is going to behave as it uh, going through this interface let us consider this com case of first perpendicular component so for the case of that we um, the component due to epsilon width is not going to contribute the only component a and upper and below part of this pill box is going to contribute so this is the electric field from the upper part is e above and the electric field from below part is e below so we have to see how it is going to change at this interface so using the equation using the same gauss law this says that gauss integral of e vector dot da is equals to sigma a upon epsilon naught so for the upper surface the area vector is in n cap direction and for the lower surface it is in minus n cap direction so we have electric field e above multiplied by a minus e below this minus sign arises because of this negative sign and you may ask this question as if you confuse that initially this minus sign is not came then we calculate this sigma upon 2 epsilon naught because in that case we are trying to find the electric field e and here in this case we our electric field is uh, going from below to above so we are uh, trying to see how the it is going to change at the interface So that's why there is this negative sign is came here. So this will become sigma upon epsilon naught. So E perpendicular is the perpendicular component. So it is perpendicular to this interface. So E perpendicular above minus E perpendicular below is equal to sigma upon epsilon naught. So this is the one boundary condition that is commonly used in most of the equations. The another boundary condition that is used is how the parallel component is going to behave so the for the case of parallel component what we have to know is how the electric field parallel uh, if you look at parallel side is given by this this line these are the parallel to this interface so we have to integrate our electric field across this line so we know how our in, in electric field is going to change in this curve so it's very much like calculating knowing the behavior line integral behavior of the electric field so for that we have to know what is the line integral of e vector dot dl since we are going to integrate it over these lines so first a very simple case let us consider that we have two points we have a charge q due to which we have electric field in different directions and we wanted to calculate how what is the line integral of electric field from a to b because of this charge q a point is at a distance of r a and b point is at a distance of r b 
Take Q uh, if they have the origin, so electric field will be in R K direction. So if you calculate DL vector in spherical coordinate, this is given by this formula is already given in grid field. So E vector dot DL is equals to only the R K component of DL will get there. Other component will become zero because the electric field E is in mode E in the R K direction. So dot product only survive with R cap. Other with other it will become zero. So when we calculate A to B E vector dot T L vector, it will become electric field due to the point charge, which is Q upon epsilon naught into R, and we have to integrate it from A to B. So when we do the integration, this is the electric field that is left. Now if we calculate the um, over the closed curve, that is we start it from A and come back to A. In that case, R A will become R B, and the electric field will become zero. Like closed integral of electric field will become zero, not the electric field. So this is the one of the equation which says that closed integral of E dot T L is zero. And the similarly as I have done earlier for the divergence form, for the differential form of this. Because it's low, we can also have the differential form of this form, which is given by Stokes theorem. I am not going to do this thing here because it is not useful for us for this time being. I'll do it in next time. So the main concept here is the closed integral of e dot dl is going to be zero. So coming back to our this parallel component of electric field that we wanted to solve. So the we uh, what we do is we take this surface and we just want it to integrate this thing. We know that the width here is epsilon, but the length here is l. This is here is l, and we want it to integrate electric field over this closed loop. And we already know that over the closed integral it is going to be zero. So Electric field. Since we know that the pin box is going half of the part is above the surface and half of the part is below the surface. So for this in line, we have E parallel above, and for this line, we have E parallel below. So we can always write when we do the integral, E parallel above into L, but the integral sign get reversed in other direction when we go to the below part. So there is no negative sign because of reversal. Direction, and that will say that E parallel above is equal to E parallel below. So this is the second boundary condition, which says that the parallel component is always going to be continuous, but the perpendicular component is have discontinuity that is depend upon sigma upon epsilon naught. So these are the boundary conditions for the electric field. But when we are talking about the dielectric materials. In case of dielectric material, we are not just talk about the electric field. There we talk about the electric displacement field because when we place a dielectric material inside the electric field, bound charges get developed because positive charge move in different direction and negative charge move in different direction. That will affect the final electric field, the final value of the electric field. So there we talk about the dielectric electric displacement vector. So the condition for the electric displacement vector is also remain the same, like the perpendicular above minus the perpendicular below is equal to sigma field charge density. Uh, this while in this derivation is I'm going to do maybe in future next lecture in future once we are de uh, develop the understanding about the dielectric, but for the sake of understanding just kept that the perpendicular above. And the perpendicular below is connected by this equation, which is the same as I have calculated for E perpendicular above minus E perpendicular below is related by sigma upon epsilon naught. So now we can go towards solving the gate questions. Uh, if you have doubt in the concept, let me know about that. Uh, Hello. Uh, do you have any doubt in the concept, or I will go towards solving the gate questions? Can I go towards the solving gate questions? Yes, ma'am. 
okay so and this question is from in gate 2020 in which we have asked which one of the following relation determine the manner in which electric field line are reflected across the interface between two dielectric media having dielectric constant epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 so we are given an interface here this is very much like a plane sheet chart and electric field above the surface is e1 and below the surface is e2 and with normal to the surface they are making an angle theta1 and theta2 the electric permeability of the surface is epsilon1 and epsilon2 for the two surfaces and we have to find which relation is correct so how we go to our solving this question is we just break this Uh, let me draw it again so we have this surface and we have the electric field component at an angle theta and we have another component e2 which is an angle theta 2 so we, what we can do is we break it in parallel and perpendicular component this is the interface so there is a parallel component and there is this perpendicular component so we have the electric field we just break it into parallel component and the perpendicular component since this angle is theta 1 this is angle theta 1 so we are left with e1 cos theta which is a perpendicular component and e1 sin theta 1 this is the parallel component and similarly we can also break e2 in perpendicular and parallel component So the perpendicular component, this angle is theta, so this is theta two. So we have e two cos theta two, and we have e two sine theta two. So this is the parallel component. So our first boundary condition is epsilon. So our second boundary condition is e parallel. So our condition is that parallel component is going to be continuous, even parallel equals to e two parallel. From that we can say that which is the parallel component? This one, epsilon one, and this one. So e one sine theta one is equals to e two sine theta two. So this is our first equation. Next second is should we use a uh, epsilon electric field like e one perpendicular above or e minus e perpendicular below? Equals to sigma upon epsilon naught, or should I use d perpendicular above minus d perpendicular below to add it? Equals to sigma three charge density. Well, if you look at this question, it is given that the dielectric medium is the interface. So we are going to talk about here is the d field, not the e field. So this is not the equation that we are going to use. This is the one, and we also not given that the interface have any charge. So there is no charge here. The sigma field charge density is zero. So our d perpendicular above is equals to d perpendicular below. So we are going to use this part here. So our d per how d is reacted with epsilon with electric field. D vector is given by epsilon into electric field. So we can also write that e1 epsilon 1 here above and below are related to this e1 and e2. So I just use e1 epsilon 1 equals to e2 epsilon 2. So we have to look for only the perpendicular component of that. The perpendicular component is cos theta 1. So epsilon 1 e1 cos theta 1. Equals to epsilon two e two cos theta two. Now this is our second equation. We can divide first equation and second equation, and we are left with e one sine theta one divided by epsilon one e one cos theta one equals to e two sine theta two epsilon two e two cos theta two. These terms got cancelled out. And we are left with tan theta one by epsilon one, tan theta two by epsilon two, or epsilon two tan theta one equals to epsilon one. And 
in tan theta we have just one which is epsilon 1 tan theta 1 but in our case we have epsilon 2 tan theta 1 so we uh, equals to epsilon 1 tan theta 2 so we can also change it like epsilon 2 tan theta 1 is gone on this side and this one is gone on this side so it will become epsilon 2 cot theta 2 equals to epsilon 1 cot theta 1 i assume that you know that tan theta is equals to 1 upon cot theta so this is the correct option in this question so i hope you will get this answer clearly so now move to the next question no ma'am i am in question i doubt in that yes yes Why we divide the equation one of two? Can you repeat it again? Why we divide the equation one of two? Actually, I'm not getting it. My network is. Uh, he he asking that why you divide equation one and two. Because we are uh, assume that we have to get answer in this form. We are only because we can divide answer. equation one by two. Yeah, this is the normal uh, process. Yeah, epsilon and theta. We in the form of epsilon and theta we have to give the answer. But our equation also has electric field part, so we have to remove that. <clears throat> and that's the way we can remove. It. Is that okay? Uh, ma'am what about the direction uh, since the electric field is shown as incident so uh, in the boundary condition uh, for e above the direction will be the outward of the plane so in this case what about the uh, means the direction is i think for e1 cos theta 1 uh, what will be the direction Downward. Actually, even cos theta one itself is a component. See, you can always write your electric field as E E parallel component plus E perpendicular component. So E B is the component, and for perpendicular component, it is perpendicular to the interface. This is the direction of electric field, and for parallel, it is parallel to the interface in this direction. These are already given. Okay. Okay. Everything is fine. Then I can move to the second question. Actually, I have uh, collected the question based on this concept. So this question is from Gate Twelve, twenty twelve. There is one more question that is coming in Gate Twenty Fourteen. And that is related to this concept. We will do it in next lecture. Maybe I don't have time today for just do this. So to infinitely extend the homogeneous isotropic dielectric media, medium one and medium two, the dielectric constant is constituted with meter and charge spectrum. Rakesh Kumar, from could you please? Oh, thank you. To Okay, so let's start with this question. To infinitely extended homogeneous isotropic dielectric media, medium one and two, the dielectric constant epsilon one equals by epsilon zero is given by two. So epsilon r for this medium is two, and epsilon r for this medium is five, and they are meet at z equals to zero plane. So for them, z equals to z direction is the interface. A uniform electric field exists everywhere. For z greater than zero, means in this region the electric field z equals to zero is the interface. Okay, so this is the z equals to zero. So z greater than zero is this region. Z less than zero is this region. And electric field in one region is given by two i cap minus three j cap plus five k cap. The interface separating the two media is charge free. So they also given that there is no free charge. The electric displacement vector in medium two. So we have asked what is the d two, and we already know that we have to find it from e two. Epsilon into e two vector equals to d two. So we have to know what is our e two. Again, we are going to use boundary condition. 
but say uh, main catching point in this question is what is the parallel component and what is the perpendicular component see for um, z equals to 0 so this z is the interface so and if you imagine that like you have this surface and z equals to 0 so you have x y and z so for x y surface is like parallel and you have just z surface which is perpendicular this interface so your e perpendicular component in e1 is 5k cap and your e parallel component e parallel component here in e1 so e1 parallel component is xy direction so uh, first boundary condition says that your e1 parallel should be e2 parallel across the surface so your e2 parallel component will then become 2i minus 3j now the problem that is coming is how the perpendicular component of e2 so the perpendicular component of e2 we have to know and we again know that our sigma s is 0 and we are talking about dielectric interface so we again you going to use that d1 perpendicular equals to t2 perpendicular this one is same i i have just used here that epsilon 1 e1 equals to epsilon 2 e2 so epsilon 1 e1 equals to perpendicular component epsilon 2 e2 perpendicular Oh, epsilon is different for one and two. So epsilon one for the medium is two, and for the medium two it is five. So we have two, and e one perpendicular is five, and we have e two which is five into e two perpendicular. Five will cancel out, so e two perpendicular will become two, and this is the kth direction. Phi is the kth direction, so e to perpendicular is this. So our total e vector is the parallel component 2i minus 3j plus perpendicular component 2k. So this is our e to vector. We have to find what is our e to vector. E to vector is epsilon 2 into e to vector. So epsilon 2 is 5. So we have to multiply it by 5. Five times two i k p j plus two k, and it will become ten i minus fifteen j plus ten k. So this is the answer. So these are the kind of problems that we generally solve. Are you able to get this concept across the boundary? This is the today's material, and I'm done with this. If you have any doubt, please ask me. Ma'am, uh, how how you calculated the uh, jet component of the E two? Across the interface. So yeah, huh? Yeah. So. 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 Then component of E. And how yeah, the parallel? Uh, how we can say that the E two, the parallel component will be same as the E one. This is the boundary condition. We have. Uh, Started with this boundary condition. It is always true that the parallel component of E is going to be continuous. This okay. comes from Gauss's law. Okay. And uh, uh, what about the th means the Z component of the E? The Z component the... has this continuity because it's the perpendicular component. And since it's a dielectric medium, so we are using this equation: the perpendicular above. Minus t perpendicular below equals to sigma c charge on cc, but it is zero, so we our t perpendicular above and below here are one and two. So I just use this one to calculate the perpendicular component. Okay. 
ओके मैम ओके ओके आर पीपल गेटिंग इट क्लियरली next time we will do another topic just want to uh, know about your feedback is this process of telling the concept first then doing the question is good for you yes it's feedback uh, ma'am uh, i think the first we first question and <laughs> concept first then concept then solution first question then concept then solution yes ma'am um, so uh, what is the question what what are the question uh, that we are going to discuss first and okay. based upon the questions we are the concepts and then the final solution okay i will do that next time okay ma'am thank you okay any other feedback i will share the okay this document will i will share on google drive and i think you will get it through nptel i will let these people know okay thank you thank you i will just watch the lecture okay thank you Thank you ma'am